This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning, everyone. Start with a few announcements as we get started this morning. Um, As you can see, set up front today is Communion Sunday. We're going to be celebrating that together. Uh, This evening uh, at 6 30 p.m., we're going to pray around the Central Noble School buildings for anybody who would like to join together in that. Uh, We're partnering together with LifeWise and some other area churches. We're going to start at Central Noble Primary, then we're going to go to the elementary building, the high school building, and then Uh, We're going to end at the admin building. So if you're able and wanting to join us this evening, uh, meet us at Central Noble Primary at 630. Um, Next Sunday is the next uh, Men's Acts 1013 meeting for the guys who have been taking part in that. Uh, That is open to all men. Um, We would encourage you to come along, hang out with us for a couple hours. Uh, Nathan, anything special about next week's meeting we need to know about? Okay, so for those attending the Wyoming trip this fall, uh, we're going to meet for just a short bit after that meeting. Um, Starting October 14th, uh, that's the first Wednesday after school starts, our bus stop ministry is going to be picking back up. Uh, I'm going to pass this clipboard back around uh, for those of you who didn't get the chance to see it last week. Uh, We're going to try something a little bit different this year um, as we're continuing to figure out exactly how to get this ministry to work. Uh, Every Wednesday through the school year is listed out on this. We're looking for people just to sign up for a handful uh, that want to come and take part. Um, Wednesday afternoons is about 3.15 to 3.45 p.m. at our various locations. If you're interested in serving every Wednesday through the whole school year, you can just write your name in the margin because I didn't leave a a spot for that. I'm not going to burden you with writing your name on uh, under every date. So I'm going to go ahead and pass that around for you guys again. What's that? August 14th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Starts, uh, starts August 14th. Um, Starting September 8th, I believe it is, is uh, the women's Bible study will pick back up for the school year. We'll be having a sign-up sheet uh, going out for that starting next Sunday. Uh, They're going to spend the first 12 weeks uh, working through the books of Ruth and Esther. Uh, So if there's any ladies that you know would be interested in studying along through that, that's going to be Sunday evenings at 630. Uh, That'll be starting the week of September 8th. Um, A couple things coming up uh, here in the new future with Inspiration Ministries. They're having their yearly fundraiser at their location in Kendaville on the 17th, their Freedom Fest. Uh, I would encourage you, if you've never been out to that, take some time on the 17th. Uh, They have a great meal. They they, uh, show everything that they have going on there. It really is a great time. I would encourage you to support that ministry in that uh, fashion. Uh, Along with that, on August 25th, uh, the Inspiration Ministries group is going to be visiting us on what they're calling their restoration tour. And basically, they are bringing a ministry update. Um, Since the last time they've been here, they formed a men's choir, so their men are going to be singing for us that morning. Um, they're, They're going to be putting on the whole service with testimonies and ministry update and everything else. Following that service... Uh, we're going to hold a pitch-in down in the fellowship for a time of uh, fellowship and shared meal with uh, the men and women of Inspiration Ministries. Next week, there will be a a sheet going out where you can sign up. The church is going to supply the main disc. We're going to ask for people just to kind of bring a side dish along. Uh, With their group, we're going to have approximately 120 people that we're going to need to be able to feed, just as you're thinking about uh, portions. So we're looking forward to that on the 25th. Um, outside of that, uh, there's no other, uh, oh, one other announcement. There was some confusion last week for the, um, the adult small group meeting on Thursday evenings. Uh, 
as far as who was supposed to show up. So if you had put your name on that list that you wanted to take part in the, uh, the midweek study that is doing the same material as the Sunday morning Sunday school, we're going to start that this Thursday here at the church, 7.30 p.m., um, uh, for those of you who wanted to take part in that. And I would encourage anybody uh, to take part. That material is helping us to understand how to connect with uh, Gen Z, ages 12 to 27. Uh, if you can't make it on Sunday morning, uh, I would encourage you to come Thursday evenings. If you are available on Sunday mornings, I would encourage you to come Sunday mornings. Uh, our adult Sunday school just finished up week two and is prompting some really good discussion for us to have. So I would encourage you to come and take part in that material. If there's no announcements that I am missing, uh, would you please join us for our, our call to worship? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let the person examine himself, and then, then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Will you all please play with me? Pray with me. Yeah. Words. Dear Lord, as we come before you this Sunday, I pray that you would watch over all of us through our week, and that you'd be with us as it might be getting a little warm and might be having some rain and other weather come in, but I pray that as we go out our week, you would just remind us that you are here, there for us, that you would guide us, give us the strength to make it through the week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jordan, can you just leave that slide up for a minute? We're going to come to the table after a while. We're going to hear some preaching of the word, and then we're going to come to the table. Our biggest problem of our lives is taken care of by what we're celebrating. Let's just sing this just to voices together. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. You guys got an idea what communion is? No. Nope. No? Okay, that's okay. So communion is something we celebrate. Um, It is a remembrance of what we read in the Bible known as the Last Supper. Do you guys know what the Last Supper is? Yeah, what's the Last Supper, Reese? Yep, that's the last meal Jesus had with his disciples. Did you? Okay. So, do you guys remember what Jesus said at the Last Supper to his disciples? Haley? Um, he basically said, take the bread, take the wine in the cup and that is my blood, and then take the bread, which is my body. Okay. Yep. So, he took the bread that they had at the supper, and he took the wine that they had at the supper, and he blessed it, and he said, this is... The bread was his body broken for everybody and his blood, the wine was his blood that was poured out for everybody. And what scripture tells us is that every time that we take part in this meal, we are to remember those words of Christ. And ultimately what that points to is his sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. Now what was Jesus' sacrifice? Save us from our sins. Very good. Yeah, Jesus' sacrifice was him dying in our place for our sins. And when we celebrate communion, we are remembering that moment. And that's actually something that I'm going to talk about in my message today. Because when we talk about believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, do you know what we're actually talking about believing in? Yeah, so we're talking about believing in a moment in time. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk to the adults about is this moment in time that we have to come and trust in. And that moment in time is when Jesus died on the cross because it was at that moment that grace was poured out, covering for sin was poured out, the Old Testament law was fulfilled, and now any who believe in Jesus can have eternal life because their sins are covered by the blood of of Christ. Does that sound pretty amazing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what we're going to celebrate and remember up here this morning, and that's what that's what communion is for. Sound good? Mm-hmm. Good. Now, there's something else important happened this week that while I have you guys up here, um, we're going to take care of, and I'm going to call up some adults to come up as well, because what starts this week? School. School. Mm-hmm. Yeah, school starts back this week. And so we want to make sure that since it is the Sunday before school starts, that our church uh, speaks a blessing over you guys and over all of the staff. So <clears throat> while I'm working on getting up, I need, <laughs> I need any, uh, any school staff to come forward. I need our board and anybody else who would like to come forward. We're going to lay hands on the, on the students and the staff, and we're going to pray for them for this upcoming year. So you've got a minute. All right, you guys, go ahead and stand up. Any teachers, any staff, um, substitutes, uh, if, you, if you work with kids in any format, public, private school, we'd like you to come on forward. If you'd like to come up and lay hands while we pray, I would encourage you to come up as well. Well, Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you first and foremost for these kids. Lord, we would ask with this upcoming school year that you would 
uh, bless them, ultimately causing them to grow in the knowledge and understanding of you. Uh, Lord, we would ask that you would give them wisdom to grow in their studies. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for the uh, staff that is present here as well. Lord, I would ask for your provision for everything that they have this upcoming year, that they would never be short in all that they need for instructing their students. Uh, Father, I thank you for them. I thank you for their hearts that want to serve the upcoming generations. Lord, I just pray for your protection on this upcoming school year, and that I pray that young or old both, Lord, that they would be drawn closer to you in their days. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Um, communion probably looks a little bit different this morning because things are going to operate a little bit different. Um, I am going to give, uh, okay, I'll put it this way. I'm going to attempt to give a shorter message than I typically give. Um, but with the way things fell on our preaching schedule, uh, I'm going to preach the, um, the meat of the message today, and then Pastor Dick is going to come up, and he's going to preside uh, over communion. Um, but what is interesting, and what I shared with our elders this past week in our elders meeting, is that God works things together um, despite, despite what I may or may not do. Um, and where we're at in John this morning, I uh, couldn't have lined up better with a communion Sunday that we're celebrating. And so uh, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, if you are visiting, if you're viewing this online for the first time, uh, take a moment. Uh, give us your contact information if you're up for that uh, so that we can stay in touch with you. Um, but let us go ahead and dive into our message. So last week, uh, last week, as we've been working through our series, No Excuses, the Gospel of John, we had this little, this little aside, and it was this story where we looked at the woman caught in adultery. And while that story most likely is not original to John's Gospel, it still highlighted the thematic difference between Jesus' character and the character of mankind. And so as we pick back up today in John 8, verse 12, this portion of John's gospel actually flows best off of John 7, verses 37 through 39. It says, as, uh, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he has said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is preaching in the temple, and it's uh, the last day of the festival of Booths, and there is division over who Jesus is. And the Pharisees believe that they know Jesus, they know where he comes from, and because of this, he could not be the long-awaited Messiah. Uh, we're going to see this theme picked back up today, along with the theme of the work that Jesus is doing. So let us be reminded of that work again with our focus verse. So go ahead and say this with me. Uh, John 6, 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father." that everyone who looks son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 38 through 40. Good, you guys go ahead and say it again. For I have come down from heaven. Husbands, please hold the hand of your wife as we pray. Father, we praise your name for giving us another day to be able to come together and, and a day to be able to celebrate and remember, remember that moment in time. Father, as we work through our message today, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to receive your word. We ask that you present yourself to us today, Lord. Father, we are 
we are a people in need of you. And so, Lord, as we come to our message and we prepare to come to the table, prepare our hearts to receive you. Let us see where you are working in our lives and in the lives of those around us and cause us to rejoice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the title of our message today is Jesus, the Great I Am, Part 1, The Magnificent Self-Awareness of Jesus. And we're looking at John chapter 8, verses 12 through 30. So if you brought your own Bible and want to follow along, go ahead and turn there now. If you're going to use the Blue Pew Bible, it starts on page 990, uh, or you can follow along on the screen. John chapter 8, starting in verse 12. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Uh, Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says, where am I going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, as we consider our passage for today, there's three biblical aspects I want us to look at. First is the light of the world, and then is the spirit of unbelief, and then finally, a moment in time. Now, in my Bible that I preach from, which is the ESV translation, there's a heading over this section, over chapter 8, verse 12 through verse 30, and that heading is, I am the light of the world. What is interesting is that in that entire section, verses 12 through verses 30, it is only, only in verse 12, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is only here that this theme of light and darkness is mentioned in this whole section. Yet my Bible carries it for the heading. So what is the significance of this saying, I am the light of the world, that the ESV would give this entire section that heading, even though it's only mentioned in verse 12? Remember, it is understood that Jesus said these words in conjunction with his statement in chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, where he said, uh, any who thirsts will come to me, and out of his heart will flow uh, rivers of living water. Uh, This would mean, like I mentioned, that this is still the final day of the Feast of Booths. Uh, We talked about when we went through uh, that section in John chapter 7 that one of the significant rituals of that day 
was the pouring of water from the fountain. One of the other significant rituals of this feast was the nightly lighting of lamps to remind the people of Yahweh leading them out of Egypt by a pillar of fire. By Jesus claiming that he is the light, he is proclaiming that he is the true light that leads people out of the darkness of sin. And while this theme is not continued through this section, what we need to understand is that this section does not introduce this theme to the reader. In fact, John introduced this theme to us in his prologue. Uh, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John then brought the reader more about this theme of light and darkness in chapter 3. If you remember, this was our focus verse for the first part of this series, John 3, 19 through 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So what we're seeing Jesus do here, as we saw in chapter 7, is that he is not introducing new teaching. Rather, he is explaining teaching that was already brought forward. Uh, in fact, the emphasis of this section is not the theme of light, but rather the theme of who is Jesus. And as we look at Jesus' initial response in verse 12, we see the second of seven major I am statements that John puts in his gospel. I am the light of the world. Now, as you were following along or as you were listening to me reading this, you may be thinking, what is the big deal? The, the phrase, I am, was said nearly a dozen times in reading this passage. Why is this first one important? And this is where grammatical distinction gets lost in translation. In each of the I am uh, here in English, uh, the first is really important for us to understand, and then its usage again in verses 18, 24, and 28. What we are seeing here in verse 12 is one of seven sayings where the I am is the predicate of the sentence. Now, a predicate is a verb that describes what the subject is or does. In other words, it is the word that holds the action of the sentence. Basically, what we see in these seven sayings is a descriptor of who Jesus is or something he does. Uh, in this, it is very similar to when the Old Testament writers attached a descriptor, a descriptor to Yahweh's name, right? Yahweh Yaira or Yahweh Shalom. It was describing a characteristic aspect of him about being their God. And in Jesus doing this and saying, I am the light of the world, he is bringing about the point of contention for this passage because what he is doing with this phrase in front of the Pharisees is he's putting himself on the same level as Yahweh. And from here, the discussion turns towards the trustworthiness of Jesus' testimony and the Pharisee's spirit of unbelief begins to be shown. And hearing Jesus' remarks, the Pharisees accuse him of being a false witness or bringing forth an untrue testimony, verse 13. And they said, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now, back in chapter 5, uh, Jesus had, in essence, agreed with this statement of the Pharisees. He said in 531, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, <clears throat> What he said at this point, Jesus, was that if there is no one or nothing that concurs with his testimony, then it is difficult to verify it. Now, in the discourse in chapter 5, Jesus brings forth four witnesses. He brings forth John the Baptist. He brings forth his works, the miracles. He brings forth the testimony of the Father. And he brings forth the testimony of the Scriptures. Yet, the Jewish leaders did not accept them at that point nor are they willing to accept them now. 
And as Jesus gets into his response to the Jews, we see the heart of the issue. Look at verse 14. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. See, the Jewish opponents to Jesus will not accept Jesus' testimony because they do not truly know him. While they believe that they know he is the son of Joseph, the carpenter, that he comes from Galilee, they are unable to really see who he is. Now, R.C. Sproul, in his commentary on this section, says the issue is that the Jewish leaders are operating out of a spirit of unbelief. As Sproul goes on to state, the spirit of unbelief accuses Jesus of being a false witness. And see, that's the thing that we have to notice here. We need to, we need to take a look at in this section. When we have a, a spirit of unbelief about us, uh, we don't simply treat Jesus as a neutral aspect. We don't simply say, okay, he's over there saying his own thing, we just disregard it. No, we accuse him of what he is saying as lies. We're not neutral, he's not neutral. If we don't believe, we say he is a liar. What he says is not true. And this is what we're seeing with the Pharisees. And this, this type of judging that is passed is a judging that comes with viewing people from the flesh, viewing people from a worldly position. Jesus went on to tell the Pharisees, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. That type of judging is not a judicial type of judging against a law, but rather it's the evaluating of an individual. And we see here in verse 15 that the standard a person is weighed against is according to the flesh, or rather they judge on that worldly criteria. Uh, and the thing is, there are many times and in many ways that we judge in the same way as the Pharisees. We wonder, what is this person going to require of me? What will it cost me? What can I get from them? What is their social status? What is their education? What is their family background? How many times have they failed before? What is their track record? What do they bring to the table? How severe are the struggles that they have? How do they present themselves? These are questions we ask of people around us all the time, so much so that often we don't even realize we're asking them. Now granted, there are occasions uh, when questions like this need to be asked. But for the Christian, our asking of questions like this should be aligned with Jesus. Notice verse 16. Yeah, even if I do judge, my judgment is true for not I alone, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. See, when Jesus evaluates someone based on these criteria, we first need to remember that his evaluation is always true. Second, we need to remember the reason for his evaluation. We got this from John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, when Jesus evaluates an individual, it's not to run them to condemnation. It's to bring them to salvation. That's what he does. You can see, Jesus evaluated the woman at the well as having five husbands and currently living with a man that was not her husband. Yet, what he brought her was life. Jesus evaluated the man by the pool to be someone who makes excuses and shifts blame about his situation. Yet Jesus healed the man and told him to sin no more. Jesus evaluated the woman caught in adultery. Yet he didn't condemn her, he extended grace. When Jesus evaluates an individual, it is to lead them to salvation. And the reason Jesus does this is because it is him operating in perfect unity with his Father. 
We need to understand that when we're talking about things like this and we're looking at Jesus and we're looking at the God overall that we read from the scripture, it is one and the same. This is God's heart for people. Now, continuing in his response, Jesus makes a pretty sharp distinction. Let's look at verses 17 and 18. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about myself. Now, it's interesting here that Jesus makes this distinction uh, with the law. He refers to it as your law, referring to the Pharisees. In this moment, he does not classify himself as being under it. He distinguishes himself from it. And, and this is an interesting point. Because what are the Jews basing Jesus against? What are they judging him against? The Word. They are judging the Word made flesh against the written Word. And in their unbelief, they are not able to see who it is that stands in front of them. Look at verse 19. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Now see, their unbelief keeps them from knowing their father, the heavenly father. Borchert, commenting on this, goes on to state, they were ignorant of both realities, the sent one and the father who sent him. If they had known the first, they would have known the second also. Uh, two weeks ago, I shared that the key behind unbelief is cynicism. It is the killer of joy and hope. It prevents us from seeking and being able to find. It will cause us to believe that we either know it all or that there is no use in growing in knowledge. Now, ultimately, it keeps us from being able to know and experience the Father. And just as Jesus made the Jews aware of this, we need to be aware of this as well. Uh, for there is a moment marked. There is a moment in time marked when all that has been done in this life will impact the next. And now as we come into this last section uh, for this morning, we're going to look at a phrase that John has used a couple times already within his gospel that we've not looked real deep at. Look at verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. John, throughout his gospel so far, has given us clues to this point as what Jesus means and what John means by stating this phrase, his hour had not yet come. But it is here, in talking to his opponents, that Jesus tells them the reality of the matter. Verse 21, so he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sins. Where, uh, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, if you remember, from chapter 7, we had a very similar phrase from Jesus, very similar statement. I am going away, and you will seek me, but you will not find me. Here, in chapter 8, Jesus adds an additional line. I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. See, there is a place that Jesus is going that on our own, we cannot. For we cannot go there because of our sins. But the remedy for this we read in verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. Unless you believe. But what is it that you are to believe? 
interestingly, we have another one of these I am statements here. And, and while it is a little different than verse 12, it is the same Greek word structure that points to the same thing that verse 12 does, which is Exodus 3.14, where Moses says, Who is it that I am to tell them sent me? And God responded to him, I am, I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. Indicating that what they are to believe, what Jesus is telling the Pharisees and the group there that they are to believe, is that Jesus is the one that was spoken of each time Yahweh said that he was the one who was going to work on behalf of the people. For example, in Isaiah 43, verses 11 through 13, I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed, and when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hands. I work, and who can turn it back? Yahweh had told the Israelites that it was him who was going to save them and no one else. That it was a work that he was going to do that no one else could turn back. And Jesus to the Pharisees is echoing the same word. And this work that he is doing, Jesus has already stated it once to Nicodemus, and now Jesus says it to the crowd, verse 28. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And here again is that same I am phrase that we see. And we see it connected to a specific occasion, the lifting up of the Son of Man. See, the light of the world came to give life to mankind. And that life comes by believing in a work that was done at a specific moment in time. The crucifixion. This is the point that matters. This is what determines if you die in your sins or if you receive eternal life. This is the gospel. Mankind loves the darkness and the evil deeds that are done in the darkness, yet Yahweh shone as light in the darkness by coming in the form of a man and dying on the cross a criminal's death, even though he committed no crime. And if you believe that, you have eternal life. And the promise of that eternal life is the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, and those who believe are filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit. And notice as we close out our passes for today, what happens in the crowd as the people hear this. Verse 30. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. By hearing, they believed. No signs, no wonders, just the simple truth. If you do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God and died for your sins, you will die for your sin. But if you do believe, then rejoice because you have eternal life. And this is what we celebrate today. As Pastor Dick gets ready to come up and officiate over communion, it is this reality that we remember that Jesus died and shed his blood so that we may be free. But that's going to be part of our message for next week. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the work that you have done. Lord, may we rejoice in it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What are you thinking at this moment? After hearing Pastor Ben, what are your thoughts? What are you thinking when you prepare to come to this table of communion?
Are you thinking of Christ's sacrifice? Or are you just going through the motions? I cannot express to you the importance of this sacrament. Why we observe it at least every two months. The root word of sacrament is sacred. When we come to this table, we come closer to God than any other moment in your life. Are you grateful for this opportunity? Are you sorry for the, any way that you have sinned against God in thought, word, or deed? Do you come with humble hearts, praising and thanking Jesus for his sacrificial act of crucifixion? It's for us to remember that when Jesus gave us the sacrament, it was at the feast of the Passover that he was having with his disciples on that last weekend of his life. John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, Jesus knew what he was about to enter into. Think of the Think of the agony, the whippings, the crown of thorns on his, beaten into his head so that blood flowed down across his face. Think of the pain. All that for us so that we might have that advantage of eternal life. So we might think about the power of the blood of the lamb, of a lamb, the power of the blood of a lamb. We sing about it in a hymn by, by Lewis, jo James, Lewis James. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. There's wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> we read in Exodus in chapter 12, when God warns the Israelites who were held as captive slaves in Egypt of a warning of a great plague that was coming to set them free. And to keep them safe from the plague, each family was to stay in their homes for that night. Each home was to sacrifice a lamb and they are to take some of the blood of that lamb and put it on the sides of, and tops of their door, door frames of their houses. So when the plague of death passed over Egypt that night, the blood would keep them safe inside their homes. And when they came out in the morning, they were set free, free from the bondage of slavery. The blood symbolizes a sacrifice offered as a substitute, one life laid down for another. So Israel escaped the judgment about to fall on Egypt only through the mediation of, uh, of a sacrifice. Jesus came to us as the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. John 3, 16, Jesus speaking, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
the truth that caused God's plan of salvation for all people on earth is John 3.16. Isaiah 53.7, prophesying of Jesus' crucifixion. Isaiah writes, he was opposed, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus remained silent before the chief priests and Pilate, and then led away to be nailed to the cross. His blood spread on the wood of the cross like the Israelites' doorframe saved them from death. So the blood on the cross saves us from death, but gives us eternal life before those who believe in him. His sacrifice, his blood on that wooden cross, frees us from the burden of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin, but reduced, but redeemed by the death and life again of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. The cross is our doorway to eternity, but we must come to it in faith and humble repentance. We have that opportunity in this sacrament of Holy Communion. Every time we participate in it, we remember Christ the crucified and the agony and the sacrifice for us. If there is anyone here who has any doubt that this is all true and you want to be sure I pray to God that this day, this morning, that you will be touched by the Spirit to convict you in your sins and that you will humbly repent of them. When we come to the table this morning, we will do it a little differently. You will not be served in your pews. I'm going to ask you to come to come here to the altar. By the action of coming here, proclaiming that you are, are, are seeking the forgiveness that only God through his son can give us. Pastor Ben, would you help me prepare the table?
Okay, so I just need to eat that and do and then I'll do this. Or this one. Father God, you are almighty and ever loving God. You have prepared this table for us in the presence of our enemies. And we pray that as we come to this table this morning, you would forgive us. We are poor, miserable sinners who confess our sins to you. And in this table, we bless you and honor you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice for all of our organs and tissues that you went through for us. Open our hearts and minds. Help us as we share forgive us for all of this that is done for us. We know only through the cross that we've been forgiven and made alive. In your son's name I pray, Lord. Amen. All of you are welcome. I ask you to start feeding the Choose not to eat. You can choose to pass it in that way. Lord, we pray that the bread and that the bitter cup be the body. soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to you and to your careful hand when I trust you I don't need to understand make me your vessel
say that they went out that night singing. I'm going to have you stand and join us in this uh, last song. Which has 